Hi, welcome to my channel, Diary of a Tent Life. I'm Lisa. Um, today I want to talk to you about five things I hate about my job. How gross is that? And I'm actually going to start with, because um, it's so gold at the moment, I'm going to start with conditions of work. And often when you're doing research with animals or you're working in an applied conservation kind of setting like I am, um, your hours and your conditions are very unpredictable. Um, some days you can work very, very long hours, sometimes not as much. You're often living in remote environments uh, and you're open to the elements. I mean, it's, uh, I think it was five, I think it's five degrees. I've got a thermometer just outside my tent. Um, but living in a tent, it's it feels a lot colder than it, it probably would elsewhere living in a real house. <sighs> yeah, you've got to get up early, uh, even on um, a day off like today. You can't really sleep in, it's loud, it's cold. You're living in a working camp with uh, rescues. Um, we've had some pretty intense rescues. One of them, say, McAleva, I spent 53 hours working straight with her just kind of running to the bathroom when I could and that's kind of it and uh, it can be very very draining and sometimes you without kind of warning you are full on. With Makaliva, with Panvu, with Mosani, with some of the other rescues it's been kind of you have a rescue and it's full on for weeks. I mean Panvu was felt like months I think we didn't leave camp for a long time. My normal number one struggle, but this is going to go number two today, missing family. And this is something that I actually didn't realise I would in the past. I feel like I've spent my teenage years um, like trying to go abroad and trying to travel and I felt like it wouldn't be a problem me living in another country and it's only as I've got older and my sister has had children and my parents are getting older that I'm really starting to miss um, miss the UK and I really really look forward to my leave time back there um, it just doesn't feel like it's long enough the problem that I have is that um, my husband's family is in South Africa we don't live in either of our home countries so we have to kind of divide our time between the two which can be really difficult and neither of our families are really in the right kind of state to be able to travel to visit us so it's kind of us that has to go either way um, and it's really really hard and I really sometimes I get frustrated and you think Ugh, why am I doing this when I'm so far away from the people I love um, it can be really hard and it's a balancing act and my aim is to get more of a balance in the future working abroad you never quite feel like you 100% fit in either places um, I always kind of when I go to the UK I kind of feel a bit sad for leaving um, my kind of life here but then when I'm in the UK and coming back here I feel really really sad leaving my family yeah so missing your family is a big one I don't necessarily know if you would have this if you were just um, an ethologist in the field I think this has more to do with me working in applied conservation I feel a huge huge overwhelming feeling of responsibility and worry and dread a lot of the times like when I hear the radio go in the middle of the night, I assume that something terrible has happened, like an elephant has collapsed or, um, I don't know, poachers on camp or someone's been bitten by a snake or someone's injured. Like, I automatically go to the worst possible scenario in my head and I don't sleep very well um, and I do kind of wake up feeling really like, <gasps> what's going on and I think that's a lot from um, 2014 when we had Palm Vu's rescue and we were getting radioed at you know two o'clock in the morning midnight um, you know because he's collapsed or something's happened and I just got in such of that frame of mind of like you hear the radio and you bounce out of bed because you need to get ready and I still like I have a pile of clothes next to my bed for the next morning like I'm always ready to kind of get up and get dressed and go out we're releasing elephants into a national park and there are obviously dangers in this national park that we um, some that we are 
helping to do things about such as poaching levels um, and human elephant conflict but there are things that we don't have control of like the lions and we have lost an elephant to lion predation in 2016 and since then like I hear lions at night and I just hate hearing them I hate it it obviously is natural there's nothing we can do about it we get a lot of wild elephants um, not too far from our tent we've got a kind of a fresh pools that especially in the winter the wild elephants come and drink at and um, like last night for example they were screaming and screaming and I did not know what was going on and we didn't know whether the release phase elephants were with them later on in the night we did hear actually the release phase elephants so they were fine um, and we saw them this morning but it's still like nerve-wracking like you I've <sighs> If I hear a lion at some point in the night and then I hear an elephant scream, I'm like automatically thinking an elephant's dead. You might think that I'm really overreacting to the lions, but it is a reality. You know, in certain areas they do, you know, they don't just kill baby elephants. They can get bigger elephants. And we've, you know, found um, a bull elephant carcass here, not one of the orphans, but one that was about eight, nine years old. Um, so there are some huge males, huge male lions around here and they have, you know, they are elephant killers. Like Theo's constantly like, you know, calm, calm, calm down. And he's very much like not a worrier. And I, so I think I worry for both of us and I worry about everyone's safety. I've got better now, a little bit better now, but the, on the walk, if I hear something odd or an elephant scream or something that just doesn't sound right, then I radio straight away and ask if everyone's okay. And I think sometimes the guys think I'm a bit over the top and I probably am but you never know um, this is a dangerous environment there are poachers around there are lions around the guys are on a walk um, yeah it, so I always feel like I'm on alert so I'm never really that relaxed I don't think I'm ever really I don't know if I've ever have a really great night's sleep here I'm not sure if I ever do and I think sometimes you can get so so wrapped up in everything and you can get really i mean burnout for conservationists burnout is a huge thing in this field and people just keep going and going and going and going and going because you've got such a sense of responsibility um such a lot of things are going on funding's always a struggle so you always feel like you need to you know like you never relaxed um and i actually got really ill um one year I just thought I was tired and I didn't realize I was quite as ill as I was it's a really strong thing in conservation and there's an organization called the lonely conservationist it's all about saving yourself before you save the world it seems like a really good group of people and I think it's a good to have that connections because again I think everyone thinks oh you've got such an amazing job that they just don't see what the challenges are you know I have my husband I have Theo so I wouldn't say I'm so much of a lonely conservationist in the strict sense of it, although that comes with um, issues as well. If anyone works with their partner, they know that there's just as much as stress as there is reward with doing that. Yeah, I think that's also why I'm struggle. I struggle to put my phone on do not disturb or ignore messages because I'm just like always on alert that there's a potential for something just awful to happen and we have had a few really really low moments like low 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 moments over the last five years and I hate that feeling I hate it and I always fear that feeling so I think again like worrying is probably worrying is worse than the actual thing maybe you can never ever make plans it's really really difficult um, to say that you're going to go anywhere or you're going to go away for the weekend or you're going to um yeah make appointments i have like a real difficulty making even doctor's appointments in lusaka or dentist appointments because i always have to change them because something always comes up there's always either issue at camp or issue with money um things always always come up and we always jokingly say that whenever there's a big event or a big fundraising event, there's always a rescue. Like, or wherever any everyone leaves the country, there's a big rescue. Um, you know, in 2017, when um, our like head of department was out of the country, so I was stepping in for her um, of eight months, whatever it was. Um, 
and our head of our vet department was also out. We had like difficult rescues um, and we had one time there was a rescue in Lusaka and out at the release facility as well so Theo had to come out here because we had other issues out here and um, I had to stay in Lusaka and I was really really hands on. I am used to that like it I, again I feel like it, it's getting harder I don't know why I think it's again because of my age maybe that I want some kind of stability and routine um, but this is not the job for stability and routine like I feel like some of the roles here have like a set 21 days working on site and camp and then seven days off with their families um, or some of the kind of town office people will work Monday to Friday I feel like me and Theo kind of in between everyone and we generally have to mold in with everyone's movements or plans or meetings or donor visits or film crews I would say if you wanted to go into a job like this you you cannot be a person that needs a really strong routine like in terms of working hours or working days like you'll be working evenings you'll be working um you'll be working weekends you'll be working holidays sometimes christmas um um again this is very much research in a applied conservation setting i'm guessing researchers who are pure research and not anything to do with management may not have these kind of issues but most researchers do need to get funding for their own research they do need to network they do need to show stakeholders what they're doing um, they do need to host visitors they have volunteers to help with their research so i do i think that it, it probably is um applicable to other jobs I don't think anyone really works in conservation or with animals for the money um, but just to make you aware that it, this kind of career path can be quite a long struggle to get a salary. A lot of people that work here did actually volunteer in the past. Um, even with a master's I ended up working for a year with no pay. Um, you know no stipend or anything and then a couple of years on quite low income and working in conservation there, there are, are issues with um, funding and that does affect things but I really felt personally that I, I, like I knew I was valued like my salary or lack of it wasn't tied to my value it's only the last couple of years that I've really got um, you know a salary that I can be proud like I don't want to say proud of actually because I wasn't unproud before at all um, but a salary that I can start paying off my debts with and um, and it's interesting because you feel kind of you feel guilty about having a salary which is really strange because I mean you know people in conservation work incredibly hard incredibly long hours um, and in not great conditions sometimes and I think it's it is strange that we uh, maybe I'm you know I know a few people that are like this I don't know if everyone's like this but you almost feel a bit awkward for getting a salary because I think people feel like you would do this job for free um, and there are people you know we all did it for free at one stage um, you know you almost feel guilty about getting a salary like you because you have you know a nice job um, you know that a lot of people would probably dream to have that you shouldn't deserve to be paid for it and it's you know, if you want good people to stay in um, areas of conservation and things to actually work, then you do have to pay a salary. So I'm not saying that there's there's no money in it because that's not true, but I'm saying it's a long it's a long path. And um, you know, even now, like I'm looking to do my PhD, so my you know money's going to go right back down again. Bonus one thing that isn't on my list of my top five worst things about my job which you probably would expect is bugs so I'm just gonna add a little bonus one in because I I don't think it's that bad at all um, but I know it's something that people who see my Instagram account get kind of freaked out by especially my mother-in-law um, tetsy flies Ooh, tetsy flies have got so much worse over the last year I don't know what it is I don't know whether it's the the lack of rain this year, um, they've just seemed to be everywhere and fast, like they're hard to kill, like they, and they get you through your, if, even if you're wearing jeans, they'll get you through them, and the other night I was lying on the bed, it was really cold at the moment, so I've got my leggings on, my thermals, and my pyjamas, and then my socks tucked over my pyjamas, and my 
uh, thermal top tucked into my pyjamas as well. So like there's not really any areas where bugs could get in, you would think. And I was sitting there and I felt this kind of tickling up my leg and I was like, what's that? And I pulled it out and this massive tetsy fly full of blood, like it was, it was gross. Like it was so full of my blood that it couldn't fly properly. Um, and it came out and it's flying around my tent and my like whole leg was swollen the next day. Um, it's really weird because normally you can feel them bite you and it really hurts, but I don't know why I didn't notice. Maybe I was so cold that my skin was numb. But anyway, we were trying to look for it in the tent and then it just vanished. So it just hid somewhere, digesting my blood. Uh, and then the next morning we actually found it and I did kill it against our window. It was so full of my blood and my blood was on our tent, which is really gross. But at least for once I knew it was my own blood. Um, so yeah, and obviously with mosquitoes, there is a risk of malaria here. Um, touch wood. <laughs> Touch wood, <laughs> um, me and Theo have been in Zambia for five years now um, and we haven't had it yet. Mosquitoes, they don't annoy me so much anymore. I've just got used to the routine of um, insect repellent. Like, I feel like living in the bush, you're either slathered in um, sunscreen in the day and then you wash that off in the evening and then you put mosquito repellent all over you. So you're always covered in some kind of mess the snakes don't bother me too much there obviously are really really venomous snakes out here we've got black mamba um we've got cobras um we don't see them very often to be honest uh, they're actually more in the nursery rather than, than in the release facility and spiders i've definitely got better with um baboon spiders i'm still really not on board with them i really hate them but the flat ones that run around they're fine i've definitely got better with the spiders um so yeah those are my top bad things about my job um, you might not think they're that bad at all in which case that's great then this job probably would be fine for you um, yeah and I'm not I don't want to moan at all I'm not meaning to moan I'm just want to give you know the realities of what it's like and you know people trying to decide their career path might actually not think of some of these things um, yeah and please take a look at my uh, top things for working in conservation as well.